In the war-torn galaxy of the 42nd millennium, the ancient imperial heroes of the past have begun to reawaken once again. The Primarchs, the Emperor's demigod sons, are one by one beginning to return to the setting. Most prominently, as of the time of this recording, we've seen Rebute Gilliman, Lionel Johnson, Angron, Mortarion, and Magnus the Red return in full force. There are, however, scattered rumors, sightings, and legends centered around many more of them, heralding their inevitable return. And one of the most interesting of these rumors centers around Corvus Corax, Primarch of the Raven Guard. If said rumors are to be believed, then he's active within the Eye of Terror, hell-bent on a singular mission of hunting down each and every one of the traitor Primarchs. But there are a few more extra details to these rumors that are admittedly a little bit disturbing. And this may not be the Corvus Corax that we remember from the Great Crusade. If said rumors are to be believed, then the Primarch has seemingly mutated into a terrifying crow-like demon, capable of harnessing the power of darkness itself to unleash all manner of bizarre and terrifying supernatural abilities. But is this actually true? Has one of the Loyalist Primarchs somehow become a demon of order? A warp spawn abomination not in service of the ruinous powers, but one that fights in the name of mankind? To get to the bottom of this, we're going to track those rumors right to the source and examine a short story known as Shadow of the Past, written by Gav Thorpe and published in 2018. A story that most of the community loves to quote into infinity, but most of us haven't actually read it. Not only is this story absolutely incredible, super dark, and admittedly kind of terrifying, but even more so, it contains some absolutely wild implications about the true nature of the Primarchs and what they're actually capable of. Also, fair warning, this is a word bearer story first and foremost, which means it's gonna contain a lot of uncomfortable subject matter, so just know that going in. So is Corvus Corax actually a giant crow demon? And if he's not, then what the hell is he? Well, in this video, we're gonna be getting to the bottom of that and a whole lot more. But before we get started, I wanted to take a minute to talk about something that us fellas never really seem to take the time to think about, and that's taking care of our skin. Not gonna lie, it's not something I ever really took seriously. I was always a two-in-one body wash shampoo kind of guy. However, when I started working long hours in front of a computer, staying up all night editing videos, I started getting these unflattering bags under my eyes and just looked tired all the time. But that all changed when Geology reached out to partner with me to bring you this sponsored video, as they hooked me up with their award-winning skincare trial set that has made a huge difference for me. If you're not familiar with them, Geology is a 22-time award-winning men's skincare company that takes men's skin seriously. They create simple and effective skincare and hair care routines customized just for you, each made with no-nonsense ingredients that have been tried, tested, and trusted by dermatologists for years. Here's how it works. First, you click on the link down in the description of this video, which will take you to a 30-second diagnostic quiz. It'll ask you questions about your skin and what your goals are, and then them and their dermatologists will design a trial set just for you. And then, conveniently, it's all shipped directly to your door. For a limited time, Geology is hooking up my viewers with an absolutely insane offer. Right now, if you use my code HAMMER70, they'll give you 70% off their award-winning skincare trial set. But wait, there's even more. On top of that, you can save big on add-on products of your choice when you add them to your trial. This is one of the best offers that you're going to see, so get it before it's gone. Again, that's Geology, G-E-O-L-O-G-I-E dot -E com. Big thanks to Geology for partnering with me to sponsor this video. Our story begins within the Eye of Terror on the demon world of Sakaris, the new capital planet of the dreaded Wordbearers Legion. It is a hellish domain built upon a foundation of slave labor, ritualistic sacrifice, and sustained human suffering. Multiple garrisons have been raised as well as several blasphemous chapels constructed in honor of the ruinous powers. Surrounding the 17th Legion's ghoulish temples are miles of tent cities that house tens of thousands of human slaves. The scene is set against a sunless sky that is said to be so unnerving to look at that it seemingly saps the souls of all of the mortal slaves that toil away under its vast emptiness. Everywhere you look here, slaves are crawling, climbing, and laboring on every surface, like writhing ants, constructing great and terrible works with no real sense of purpose or self. They are a broken people, miserable wretches that have had their will to live and all semblance of emotion seemingly ripped out of them through a combination of exposure to the warp's horrors and the word bearer's infinite capacity for cruelty. These individuals have been so broken, in fact, that at one point in the story, one of the word bearers mentions that they may have gone a bit overboard, as killing them in their rituals doesn't generate much energy at all. 
The gods demand particularly brutal sacrifices, and the more pain, suffering, misery, and heightened emotions of all kinds involved in the act exponentially increases the value of the sacrifice. The word bearers being the monsters that they are though, it work around this by simply sacrificing more of them at once to get the desired results. Their rituals serve all manner of dark purpose, but the major one is keeping a series of soul wards around the fortresses functioning. This is of critical importance to their operation, as it's the only thing that keeps the demonic entities prowling the planet's surface and the adjacent void at bay. It's important to remember that even though Chaos Space Marines frequently summon demons to assist them in battle, the word bearers possibly being most famous for this, they are under no false pretenses that demons are actually their allies. Demons are evil, twisted, manipulative, and above all else, incredibly dangerous entities. A demon can never be truly trusted, and the only way it can be used properly is if it has been bound to the will of a powerful summoner, and thus only shackled demons are permitted to exist within the boundary of the wards. The main character of this story is a word bearer known as Kalta R, a recently appointed Dark Apostle, and him and the legionaries that follow him are overseeing the construction of a massive temple known as the Benefictia Diabola. The Dark Apostle and his second in command, Arkula, are looking over one of the balconies, watching the slaves work when they're approached by another word bearer. The legionnaire informs the two that another one of their brothers has gone missing and wasn't answering the comms. This is the fourth such disappearance that has occurred within the last 12 hours, which is alarming to say the least. Certainly the slaves couldn't have had anything to do with it as they were far too broken to mount any form of actual resistance. And even if they did, they presented little threat to a legionnaire in full power armor. The most likely culprit is that one of the wards had failed and a demon had gotten in. When they go to inspect the wards, however, they can't find any fault with them. The barrier is maintaining and nothing seems to be out of the ordinary. They had no idea what was causing the disappearances, but based on the energy within the runes, they could safely rule out that it was a demon. Just to be sure, however, the Dark Apostle commits to another ritualistic sacrifice, wherein he murders 50 slaves. No matter how many he kills though, the wards don't noticeably appear to change. Right before he can go to sacrifice another slave, the ritual is suddenly interrupted by a scream cutting across the box, a drawn out agonizing sound that the Dark Apostle had never expected to hear from a legionnaire. It lasted for what seemed like an eternity before abruptly cutting out, only deathly silence following. The Vox signal had originated from Brother Kyalak, so the Dark Apostle sends the legionnaires in the room to investigate. They close in on his position approximately 30 seconds later and inform him that they had found him, or at least what was left of him. He asks them for clarification, and they respond that he needed to come down and see this for himself. When he gets there, his eyes are immediately drawn to a group of seven slaves standing near the body, with their heads bowed and eyes fixed on the remains. If this had been a demon attack, then why were they still alive, and why weren't they terrified? When he shifts his gaze over to the dead legionnaire, he's greeted with such a grisly sight that it manages to unnerve even a dark apostle of the word bearers. Not only had the victim been dismembered and decapitated, but the rest of the remains had been utterly shredded. Worse yet, judging by the length of time of the screams on the Vox and a thorough inspection of the murder scene, whatever did this had kept him alive, severing the limbs to incapacitate the prey before moving up and saving the head for last making sure that he had felt every agonizing cut. The Dark Apostle swings around and grabs one of the slaves by the face, demanding to know what did this and what they saw. The slave, without any shred of emotion, tells him that it was a shadow. A shadow had picked him up and cut him to pieces. The word bearers argue back and forth with each other briefly, one stating that it had to have been a demon, there was nothing else that could do something like this, whereas Keltal R reminds them that the wards were sound. It wasn't possible for a demon to walk into this area from outside, so they believe that it must have been the slaves that had summoned something before the wards went up, something that had been lurking in the darkness and waiting for the opportunity to strike. As illogical as it sounds, the theory holds some weight. Perhaps the slaves had put all of their belief into this singular demonic entity and truly believed that it would save them. Thus, when it attacked, they had been spared. Furious over this realization, the Apostle spins back around to the slaves, advancing with murderous intent. What have you done? What have you unleashed, you God's damned Cletans? He holds up his ritual blade to the group. You are going to confess your wrongs, or you will know pain greater than anything you have lived through thus far. Said the slave, It backed away a step, holding up a hand. A 
Enough of your lies, scum, said Arkula. He slapped a hand back across the face of the nearest slave, slamming it into a rough wall. The skull cracked hard, leaving blood on the pale plaster. Kelta R had expected an outburst, cries of anger, of pain. Not one of the slaves even moved towards their injured companion. He saw that their attention was fixed not on the wounded slave, nor Arkula, nor the Dark Apostle. They looked at something behind and above him, with a mixture of growing horror and disturbing smiles. He turned around quickly, pulling free his Crozius. The other legionnaires responded with him, bolters raised. A thing like a shadow waited on top of the wall. It was impossible to make out its actual shape, though there seemed something vaguely humanoid about it. Before any command could leave the Dark Apostle's lips, it sprang upwards, silhouetted against the ruddy sky. The shadow fragmented with an ear-splitting screech. Dozens of winged shapes fell upon the word bearers, beaks like plasteel blades, slashing at their armor. Hora went down under the first flurry, losing an arm as he toppled, his war plates scattering like pieces of torn paper. Fall back, barked Arkula, his commander's instincts taking over in the face of the unnatural apparition. His tone brooked no argument, even Kaltalar found himself responding, retreating swiftly through the door. The word bearers retreated inside of their fortress, leaving their comrades to their fate. The survivors gathered around the Dark Apostle, looking to him for guidance, but before they could make the next move, they heard a shout from over the Vox. It was Hasta, a legionary that was stationed on the other side of the fortress over a mile away. He yelled that something was in the eastern repository. More screams over the Vox, then another channel opened, a word bearer shouting on the other end that there was something moving through the vaults. His voice was suddenly cut short and another link opened, shouting that some kind of black pool had appeared and swallowed up one of his brothers. Another link opens, reporting that some kind of black ooze was bleeding out of the walls. Suddenly, the sound of bolter fire and screams erupted over the Vox, cutting out with an eerie static. Having no real idea what was going on, the word bearers listened to the Vox helplessly as the creature began to hunt down and systematically slaughter each and every one of their brothers. Whatever this monster was, it was attacking in multiple locations simultaneously, each manifestation displaying even more horrific abilities. Trying to regain some form of composure in the group, Kalta R thinks logically about the situation. This thing couldn't possibly be as powerful as it appeared. Demons were known for their trickery, and if this was some invincible monstrosity, it wouldn't be trying to pick them off one by one. Bolters weren't going to do them any good. The only way to deal with a demon like this was to banish it, or better yet, bind it to their will and turn it back against the miserable slaves that thought to trouble them with the detritus of their worthless prayers. They realize that the location that they are in is not safe, but they don't want to abandon this facility, as it's far too important to them. First and foremost, they have the demon to worry about, but if their theory is correct and it was summoned by the human slaves, then a revolt was sure to be coming. These were trained Astartes, and one-on-one, -on -one, an unarmed mortal posed zero threat to them. However, there were only a handful of them stationed within the Beneficia Diabola, and they were potentially outnumbered a thousand to one. They do not have the manpower or the ammunition here to deal with both that many slaves and a demon of unknown origin. Their best bet was to make it to the portal bridge on top of a hill in the waste, just outside of the temple on the other side of the rune barrier. If they could make it there, they could meet up with their brothers, as well as their Primarch Lorgar, if the threat proved to be too much for the combined force to handle. They ran towards the north gate, no sign of the demon or slaves marking their path. An ominous silence filled the air, accentuated only by the percussion of their boots and distant tortured screams. Eventually, they rounded a corner into a large antechamber and came into contact with a horde of slaves, their glossy-eyed demeanor from before replaced with twisted and desperate anger. The Dark Apostle pulled out his plasma pistol and launched a ball of searing energy into the closest slave's chest, instantaneously incinerating him. The other word bearers followed suit, pulling out their chain swords before slamming into the frenzied mob. Although the slaves were fighting with the furious desperation of those who have for the first time in decades tasted hope, they were getting slaughtered, chain swords ripping and tearing while armored fists dashed heads against walls. Suddenly, the melee was interrupted by a vast, dark shadow that swept through the antechamber, causing all of the slaves' eyes to twitch with its passage. With no hesitation, the shadow launched itself at the word bearers. Mouse with dozens of lightning fangs opened in a cloud as it fell upon Apollof. It seemed as though an invisible blade punctured the word bearer's gut and lifted him, erupting through his backpack in a shower of ceramite splinters, shattered bone, and blood spray. 
Armor plates fractured as maws sank their insubstantial teeth into the legionnaire, snapping limbs and rending bloody welts into the flesh within. His agonized bellows blanketed the box for a second until Kaltal R cut the link. Arkula threw himself at the demon, chainsword snarling. A bladed limb snapped out, taking off his head with an almost contemptuous swipe. The Dark Apostle cried out for his brothers to follow, and the survivors turned and ran, barreling through the narrow passages that led to the northern wall. He believed that if the demon had truly been summoned within the ward circle, then it might not be able to pass through. All they had to do was make it to the other side. This would, of course, leave them open to the hungering demons on the other side of the protective field, but in this particular circumstance, the unknown enemy was certainly preferable to what was hunting them. They ran as fast as they could, the Dark Apostle hearing the guttural wet noises from several of his battle brothers succumbing to the pursuing demon just meters behind him. He didn't look back as he ran, and eventually, sensing that at any moment he would feel the sharp stabbing pain of a taloned limb burst through his chest, he leapt out of a stained glass window into the open, gloomy expanse of the planet's surface below. He got to his feet and continued to run. Suddenly, he felt a fizzy static pass through his body, a sign that he had escaped and passed through the boundary wards. He finally turned back around and saw only a handful of his brothers had survived and followed him through. Of the demon, though, there was no sign. There were, however, slaves laboring all over the place out here, attending to their tasks as if nothing had happened. After they regroup, the word bearers moved up onto the hill that the portal gate was on and looked out over the expanse. There was another group of legionnaires here, one in Terminator armor that the Dark Apostle recognized as Marduk, a first acolyte appointed by Master Jarlik in Erebus. Call to R demands to know where the Primarch is, and Marduk tells him to calm himself and explain what this is all about. Irritated by the first acolyte's tone, as it lacked any form of respect for one's superiors, the Dark Apostle informs him that they believe the slaves had summoned a demon, and it had already slain half his company. Marduk looked at him quizzically and asks him if that's true, why the hell he would lead it here? They look back out over the expanse towards the inside of the rune circle and see another word bearer rushing to meet them on the hilltop, when suddenly, the ground beneath his feet begins to darken like tar, bubbling up from a pit the blackness sweeping up his legs and swiftly engulfing him at the waist. The black mass swept upwards, lifting the helpless space marine into the air before twisting and turning his body into disturbing, unnatural angles, to the point of almost tying the warrior into a knot. The demon shape dropped the remains and descended to the ground, taking on a vaguely humanoid form. It stood twice as tall as a legionnaire, and shadowy black wings flowed from its back, its arms ending in spear-like talons. What have you brought upon us? Said the Terminator. I had no choice, said the Dark Apostle. It would have slain us all and come for you without warning. Ah, so it was for our well-being, was it? Look at it, brother. This is beyond us. We need the Urizen to face such a creature. You must call him. Despite the Dark Apostle's demands, the Terminator says that the Primarch has far more pressing concerns than their well-being. The sound of concentrated bolter fire drew their attention back to the ward ring, wherein the legionnaires on the hill had opened fire on the creature, bolt rounds detonating across its form, but their fury disappearing into its darkness. Its advance never halted. The creature fluctuated, its dark shadowy form suddenly switching to snow white, and two dark black eyes opened in the middle of its face. It lifted its arm, and forks of black lightning leapt from its outstretched hand, ripping through the body of a nearby word bearer. Kaltal R turned back to the Terminator and told them that they had to fall back to the portal bridge, that they had to fetch Lorgar. They then heard a voice as pure as molten gold. Fetch, it said. The voice was like honey, and instantly lifted the Dark Apostle's spirits, filling his soul with warmth. They turn and look, and see that the portal had activated, shimmering with the image of a grand cathedral on the other side, with a towering, golden-skinned entity, three times the height of an Astartes, wielding a wickedly spiked mace, standing directly in front of it. Lorgar Aurelian, the Archpriest of the Primordial Truth, the Primarch of the 17th Legion, stood before them. Lorgar tells the Dark Apostle that he had heard his woes and came to assist. Kaltal R begs his forgiveness and pointed back at the word circle. A demon had come to disrupt their great work. Lorgar looks out at the creature and tells his son that that was no demon. The shadowy figure had stepped across the ward barrier as if it didn't even exist, and at this point had made its way all the way up to the top of the hill, striding through a storm of bolter fire with relative calmness. It cast aside legionnaires with sweeps of its glittering claws, leaving tattered remains draped across the stonework. Lorgar pointed his mace out at the creature and says, Come to me, brother. 
The apparition coalesced into a recognizable figure. It was of equal height to the demon Primarch, clad in black battleplate with long taloned gauntlets. A pair of wings stretched from its ornate backpack, fashioned as intricate metal raven feathers. The face was as pale as snow, gaunt, with eyes as dark as coal, framed by shoulder-length black hair. Kalta R felt his breath dying in his lungs as he looked up at the unmistakable features of Corvus Korax, the Primarch of the Raven Guard. A flurry of questions flooded his thoughts, but all remained unanswered as Korax spoke. What has happened to you, brother? I have ascended, said Lorgar. He indicated Korax with a twitch of his rod. I might ask the same of you. The Raven Lord strode forwards, intent on Lorgar Aurelian. Kaltaar and his warriors scattered before him, grateful to be free of his wrath. Mardok and his courtier closed upon their Primarch, but a look sent them away. I am what I have always been, said Korax. I am vengeance incarnate. I am justice delivered. I'm Batman. This place beyond the veil has revealed what we are. Underneath the veneer of humanity our father crafted for us, we are of the warp. Have you come to make oath to the powers that are your true creator? No. I swore to destroy all chaos tank from the galaxy. You will be the first fallen brother to die beneath my blades. I am not the creature you fought at Istvan, said Lorgar, raising his mace. Nor am I. Kalta R barely followed the lunge of Korak, so swift it was. A black wind threw him aside as dark fire crackled from the rod of Lorgar. With a thunderous shockwave that hurled the word bearers to the ground, the two demigods clashed. After a long life of bloodshed and devotion to the true gods, there was little that awed Kalta R. The sight of the two Primarchs battling within the Empyrean Sphere left him shocked and breathless. Infused with the raw primordial force, the combatants were ablaze with power. Korax seemed a towering storm wreathed in white lightning. The clouds formed of multitudinous ravens. Their cawing was deafening. The flash of their talons and beaks, the spark of the tempest. Into the shadow, Lorgar rose like a fireball, alighting with a tornado of burning rune shapes. Meteoric sigils rained down on the raven tempest, cleaving ember-edged furrows through the dense mass. They slammed into the buildings around the bridge arc, shattering masonry and incinerating the corpses of Korax's victims. The Raven Lord struck back, hails of flaring claws ripping the air itself, leaving rents through the rune robe of the Eurysian. Each stroke left a shriek in its aftermath that shredded the nerves as much as the talon shredded Lorgar's immaterial form. Kaltaar flinched when the sweeping head of the Wordbearer's mace slammed into the chest of the storm-wreathed foe. The impact was greater than any thunderclap, leveling the walls around them. Rolling to his back, shattered stone pouring from his armor, the Dark Apostle watched the titanic combatants soar past. Korax was a quartet of gleaming spear talons driven through Lorgar's throat. The Eurysian tried to lash out with his mace, but was held close by the Raven Lord's inhuman grip. Together, they crashed to the ground, their impact flattening again the few word bearers that had regained their feet. It's then that the Dark Apostle realizes that the wards are flickering, a bad omen of what was to come, as they were directly tied to the Primarch's will. He was losing. The two demigods were standing in the crater their landing had made. Lorgar, clearly badly wounded and panting for breath. Korax flexed his claw-like blades, his expression pitiless. He took a step towards his brother. In desperation, the remaining word bearers opened up with their bolters and plasma pistols. Lorgar summoned a nimbus of roiling hurricane-like energy that knocked Korax into the air, who then morphed into a flock of fire-eyed black birds that scattered in every direction to dodge any further attacks. This gave the word bearers precious moments to escape, and they used them to run to their lord's side and help him through the portal. On the other side, they found themselves inside Lorgar's private sanctum. The group looked back at the portal and saw the raven flock furiously scratching and pecking at the barrier, but no matter how hard the frenzied swarm of birds attacked it, they were not able to pass. Lorgar stared back as his brother once again assumed his humanoid form. His cheeks were bloodied and bruised, and one of his eyes was swollen shut. There were huge amounts of damage to his armor, but despite his injuries, he leaned close to the portal, his one open eye boring through the divide. I have your scent now, Lorgar, growled the Raven Lord, his face contorted with monstrous rage. I will find you. I will destroy you and every vessel you have filled with your taint. Having seen enough, Lorgar closed the portal and staggered away. The Dark Apostle tells his Primarch that all wasn't lost, that they could rebuild, but Lorgar doesn't answer. As the group begins to walk through a large open door, it suddenly slams shut behind Lorgar, leaving the group behind. There was no visible keyhole or any way to open it, 
But there was, however, a single glowing Colchisian rune that translated to the phrase, deny fate. Kalta R asks Marduk what it means, and the Terminator says simply, we wait for his return. Until then, the great work must continue. And that was Shadow of the Past. So what can we take away from this story? Well, first and foremost, we can certainly put to rest the idea that Korax is a demon, as Lorgar directly states that he isn't. And if anyone can claim to be an authority on demons, it would certainly be the Primarch of the Wordbearers. But if he isn't a demon, then what exactly is he? As in this story, he's demonstrating some pretty remarkable powers that we would commonly associate with those who have risen to demonhood. Or at the very least, somebody who has given their soul over to the ruinous powers in order to pursue the dark path of sorcery. I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and say that I'm pretty confident this isn't what happened, as out of all of the Primarchs, considering that what happened to Korax and his legion on Istvan, he is potentially one of the least likely to commit such a heresy. I would put forth that what we are seeing is something indicative of what all of the Primarchs are capable of, but Korax is just the first of his kind. I believe that the Raven Lord has become an ascended Primarch. The true nature of what the Primarchs actually are has yet to be revealed and is left intentionally murky. We do know that they are a fusion of components from the physical and immaterial universe. We know that the God Emperor entered into some kind of agreement with the Chaos Gods on Molech, one in which he never intended on following through with. Regardless of what he promised the gods, what they provided in return was access to the raw energy of the warp, as well as the knowledge to combine it with his gene crafting to create his demigod sons. I've seen a lot of people in the community say that the Primarchs are essentially warp entities wrapped up in human flesh, and although that is quite the mental image, and not literally true, it's still a pretty great analogy for what they actually are. They're like the half-angel, half-demon Nephilim of ancient Terran myth. The Primarchs are entities of both the material and immaterial universe, each capable of remarkable abilities derived from both sources. Their abilities from the physical universe are represented through their enormous strength, speed, resilience, healing ability, and mental acuity, whereas their warp-born nature is reflective of certain powers that each of the Primarchs are able to manifest. When it comes to Korax, his signature ability was known as Wraith Slipping, and when utilized, it allowed him to erase all perception of his physical body from the minds of anyone around him, not literally rendering him invisible as he could still be perceived by artificial constructs, but when fighting flesh and blood opponents, it was as if he was able to disappear at will. It made him one with the shadows, and a remarkably deadly fighter that could vanish into thin air and then strike again from any direction. Bear in mind that this is what he was capable of 12,000 years ago during the Great Crusade, but considering that by all accounts he has been in the Eye of Terror since then, hunting down the other traitor Primarchs, and has been active the entire time, it's reasonable to believe that he's been honing that ability to the point of perfection, where it has now evolved into something far more terrifying. Whereas before Korax was just a Shadows Appreciator, he has evolved into a full-fledged Avatar of Darkness evolving his ability to simply disappear into the shadows into a whole swath of shadow-based powers. He can turn himself into a swarm of murderous crows to attack groups of enemies or avoid incoming attacks, strike in multiple locations simultaneously, assume a form of shadow or light, send crackling waves of lightning out of his fingertips, and even create and weaponize the darkness itself, turning shadows into living weapons that can consume and tear apart enemies at range. But what evidence do we have that this is actually true? Well, we can look no further than the recent return of Lionel Johnson, as in his novel Son of the Forest, he gains the ability to forest walk, wherein he can enter the ethereal ghost of Caliban's woods, and by journeying through the forest, he can re-emerge from it any distance away, whether that be directly behind enemy lines or halfway across the galaxy. This is not a power that he had during the Great Crusade, it's something that had awakened in him over time, and in the beginning of the novel, he has barely any control over it. He has to dedicate a lot of time and mental energy in order to master it, and by the end of the book, he's able to utilize it at will, even taking groups of marines with him. I firmly believe that what we witnessed with Corvus Corax is something very similar to what we see with the lion. However, considering that the lion was asleep for an enormous amount of time, and Corvus has been training and honing his abilities ever since his disappearance, I believe that the Raven Lord's powers have had far more time to reach even greater heights. It's important to know that time does get a little weird in the warp. Some of the Chaos Space Marines that were alive during the Siege of Terra 12,000 years ago only believe a couple of hundred or maybe a thousand years have passed. Hell, some of them feel like it only happened a few weeks ago. We don't really know what his perception of time is, and so maybe he's been training for a few years, centuries, or even millennia. 
But it is worth noting that when he reveals himself in the story, Lorgar doesn't make any kind of mention of him looking like an old man like what happened with Lionel Johnson. But I feel this could also easily be dismissed considering that he's a being of living shadow with swords for fingers. The other possibility is that his evolution came from the mutating powers of the warp, and that very well may have played a role in his advanced development, though we don't exactly know what prolonged exposure to the warp does to a Primarch, but considering their nature is a half-warp entity, it's probably not as dramatic as what we've seen with Chaos Space Marines. We don't see demons and other warp entities consistently evolving into more powerful forms just by existing within the Immaterium. I'll freely admit that a lot of this is just me thinking out loud and trying to put the pieces together, but there are a considerable amount of unknowns still. I believe that when Corvus Corax inevitably returns to the tabletop game, Games Workshop will give us a novel that makes a lot of this more clear, considering that bringing back all of the Primarchs seems to be Games Workshop's current MO. What's truly the most interesting part of all this to me, though, is the implication that all of the Primarchs are capable of something similar to what Corax managed to accomplish, that the path to demonhood that the traitors chose was only a a shortcut, that the Loyalists are capable of reaching equal heights of power. What does this mean for the Loyalist Primarchs that have yet to return? What would an Ascendant Khan, Lehman, Vulcan, Dorn, or even Gilliman look like? What would they be capable of? Let me know all your thoughts in the comment section below, as I'm always curious to hear what you all think. Anyways, that's really all I had to say on this one. I'm planning on making a lot more videos like this, where I take a common misconception within the community and clear it up, while also talking specifically about how the reality of said misconception is actually way more interesting than the misconception itself. Corvus Corax, for some reason becoming a giant crow demon, is definitely interesting, but the idea that he turned into the Avatar of Darkness itself through dedication, discipline, and an unquenchable thirst for vengeance is so much more badass to me than him just being a demon for some reason. Anyways, again, that's all I had to say. Big thanks to everyone who supports the work that I do, and I will catch you all in the next one.